Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. What a difference a week makes. The Calgary Flames are now working on a four-game win streak. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, let's flip things around this week. Let's talk about the games that the Flames have played first, and then we'll come back to our overall thoughts. Okay. That works for me. First game of the week, the Calgary Flames were at home back in their sort of own barn for most of the month. And this was one of those games. These uh, Buffalo Sabres came to town and Calgary ended up winning this game four to three. Some important milestones for the Flames. Johnny Goudreau got a sixth goal of the game and Milan or sixth goal of the season. Sorry. And Milan Lucic is first. So some important milestones in that one. I don't think that the final score tells a story here. I mean, the Flames kind of played well for 55 minutes, and then the last five, McCabe and Eichel potted two. I thought that the Flames should have had an eight or ten goal game with the way that, or an eight or ten goal lead at least with the way they were playing. Yeah, this one, the score really extremely flattered the Buffalo Sabres, and this was vintage Calgary Flames from the early part of last season, where everything goes right and they just absolutely walked all over the buffalo sabers and it, you know it it's weird that the flames had nine penalties in this game because of the fact that they were just dominating buffalo all over the ice and it seemed like even though they were down a man for one of the three periods they were still able to effectively win the game and control it for everything until the last couple minutes Looking at the stat sheet, the only thing the Flames really didn't control here was face-offs. They only won 46%. Yeah, and even then, that's not too bad. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I thought coming on into this one, I thought, wow, this Flames team, if they can play like this for the majority of the season, you're going to win more often than you're going to lose. Yeah, and that's pivotal for this team. And the reason why they were the best team in the West last year uh, in this is what we've been missing from this team and what our expectations for this team have been all season. And it's nice to see after the whole craziness with the old Bill Peters thing that this team was able to resume playing the way that that we're used to. And I think the story for me in this game was the depth scoring. I mean, we see, of course, Goudreau Monaghan each get a goal, but also Tobias Reeder, his second of the year, and Milan Lucci just first as a flame. Um, you know, I think that you and I have talked about it, that good teams get depth scoring. And between this game and the L.A. game, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's really what we're seeing here. Yeah, and Calgary is only successful last season just due to their excellent depth scoring. And having guys like Jankowski throwing in uh, 13 or 14 goals. And that's one of the things that has been lacking from this team this season is that unless the first line is doing something, the Flames aren't usually winning. And the first line hasn't really been doing a lot. And that's why the Flames have been a 500 team up until this week. And then the next game of the week was Hockey Night in Canada, Saturday, December 7th, uh, late start here in Calgary, an 8 p.m. start as the Calgary Flames took on the L.A. Kings. And I was worried that this one might end up becoming the um, kachuk Doughty feud again, but we really saw very little of those two against each other. And an- another win for the Calgary Flames, a 4-3 win over the Kings. And... Um, and we got Milan Lucic's second goal of the year. Zach Ronaldo got a goal, and Dylan Dubé got his got his third. Uh, Sean Monahan is eighth. So Matt, after this game, Milan Lucic has two, and Johnny Goudreau has six, which means Lucic is on pace to beat Goudreau right now. Yeah, well, that's just exactly how everybody expected it to be this season. You know, say goodbye to that third round pick, gentlemen. Yeah. Um, at, at first we had it, and now it's gone again. <laughs> you know, but but just, I mean, it's so weird that Lucic has more goals, and even at this point, um, uh, Mangiapani is tied with Goudreau for goals. Oh, I know. And you can tell that Goudreau's been having a bit of struggles this season, and, you know, that's plainly evident. And now it's nice to see that Lucic is finally getting rewarded in, I 
you know, for me, like, I know that some people have been criticizing him just because, oh, his contract isn't very good. But he's been a very excellent addition to the third line for the entire season. And a lot of times he hasn't uh, had pucks go in, but he's doing all of the things away from the puck that you would like him to do. And I've... I saw some stats like on uh, with James Neal five on five, and now I, I think Lucic is like one goal behind Neal five on five, and yet is significantly better in the Corsi and like all the other advanced statistics, and that is why the Flames made the trade. And you know, yeah, Neal has a whole bunch of goals, fourteen now, and. You know, he can finish on the power play. And, you know, when you have McDavid and Dreisaitl, I think I could even score a few goals in the NHL. Just have my stick there and, okay, McDavid, hit it. And, <laughs> you know, you're good to go. And Hey, if Zach Ronaldo can get an NHL goal this year, you can get at least one. You know, and it it's one of those things where the getting rid of Neil and for Lucic has actually, in my opinion, benefited our team because you're not looking for a scorer on your third line. You're looking for a responsible player overall, and Lucic is a far more responsible player overall and brings, you know, that physical toughness and all that kind of stuff as well. So Not only that, I mean, and, and I see this team from a different perspective than you and a lot of fans because I spend time in the room after the game and, you know, at ice level a lot. And for me, James Neal seemed to be pouting a lot last year. And Lucic, he brings a good energy. You can tell the guys respect him. Like, it's just, I, I think there was more than just getting rid of James Neal, the hockey player. I think there were some issues there in the room and Lucic definitely is part of the leadership group of this team now. Yeah. And I think that like, especially come playoff time, if Neil or uh, Lucic can um, bring that intensity and even if he doesn't even chip in any goals or anything during the playoffs, but just is, himself that will have a far greater impact than what james neal would bring for sure um so the flames finally get their win over the la kings in this one really got to give these guys credit in this game because they did come from a two nothing deficit i mean we had the kopitar and dowdy goals in the first uh early in the first and really i was worried at that point i thought crap this game's getting away from the flames and then we saw lucic Ronaldo, Monahan, and Dubé come in and score for the Flames. And Matt, you got to be thinking if you're Mark Jankowski, who is sitting out in this one, uh, healthy scratch, and Zach Ronaldo has more NHL goals than you, you got to be thinking, crap, I got to get back in my game here. Yeah, well, I'm sure that he got ribbed a bit. Yeah. You because know, I know I'd be giving him a little bit of a hard time on that. Like, come on. Zach Ronaldo now has only four or five goals less than Monahan or uh, Goudreau this year. Yeah. Well, so, you yeah, see, Ronaldo and Lucic are half a Gaudreau. <laughs> there you go. But again, good to see the depth scoring, right? Yeah. I mean, technically, Dubé and Ronaldo both call ups and both get a goal here. So half our our goals come from AHL call ups. I mean, that's what you got to do when we when we're waiting for guys like Gaudreau to get going. You need the depth to float this team. Yeah, and Ronaldo, I thought had a really good game overall, and. I know that he got that game misconduct and the hit and all that. And I thought that hit was actually a-okay um, because it looked like a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder hit, not, you know, shoulder-to-head or anything like that. But, yeah, I think that uh, having him do that, though, it sent a message to the Kings of, like, stop, you know, whacking Gaudreau, uh, for one, because, you know, otherwise you're this is going to keep happening type of thing. And, you know, you don't want to see games devolve into, you know, that kind of nonsense. So I also think that um, Ronaldo was able to take a lot of the heat that Kachuk probably would have taken from the Kings otherwise. Yeah. And that's why you have Ronaldo. Like back when we signed them, some, I know some fans were like, Oh, why did we sign this guy? And it's for situations like this Kings game. The Kings are a terrible team. 
and we already coughed up four points to them and needlessly and you need to have a deterrent and you know the kings aren't going to make the playoffs they're going to be dead last probably or slightly ahead of anaheim at the end of the season they're a bad hockey team and their main goal is to screw with us because of the whole kachuk thing and you just need to have you know something there to stop that kind of bs from happening and that, that way you can walk over the loser team that they are and carry on and go face Colorado. Yeah, there you go. You're right. Um, some notes here that I made for for this game. And I mean, I agree with everything you just said, but um, Jeff Ward had mentioned after the Buffalo game, like you said, way too many penalties, a lack of discipline. He couldn't have been happy with that first period, but good thing the Flames turned it around. I noticed that Lucic was probably the flame that I noticed the most for positive reasons in the first period. He was really playing hard, and I think he got rewarded with you know his goal. He was just always in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. And I also noted here that Monahan goal, like that whole play around it with Goudreau, that's what you need from your top guys. And when Goudreau passed to Monahan on that tight angle, I thought there's no way this is going in. But you know that's what those top guys need to do. Yeah, that was vintage Gaudreau and Monaghan there, and you know, like last week, uh, I was, you asked me if Lucic was going to score this month, and I said yes, and I, you asked if Gaudreau, when Gaudreau and Monaghan would break out, and said in the Buffalo game, and on both counts, I was right, and I can't get the games that we predict each week right, but you know, get me to call, you know, when this guy is going to score. I'll get it right. <laughs> but there, well, yeah. there, we both have our own talents, right? Yeah. And, you know, uh, Monaghan scored the overtime winner against Colorado. And, you know, it, it seems like the guys are getting back into being themselves. Well, let's talk about that Colorado game. So Calgary's uh, homestand was a two-game homestand. Now they're on the road for two. Tonight, Monday night, the 9th, they are in Colorado and played against the Avalanche. And for me, this was the game when I looked at it that I said, this is really going to be the test of how well the Calgary Flames have turned things around, whether they can win this one or not. And um, an interesting back-and-forth game here. Um, Derek Ryan... Matthew Gachuk on Andrew Mangiapane and Michael Froelich scoring regulation to make it a 4-4 tie. And we went to the overtime and Sean Monaghan nets the winner in this one to get the Calgary Flames a 5-4 win over the Colorado Avalanche. Say what you want about the Avalanche playing their third string goaltender and things like that. You know what? This was a, this was a hard fought game by both teams and the Calgary Flames look like the better team for this game. Yeah, I thought that, frankly, Colorado was a little on the lucky side to be going to overtime in this one. And I thought Calgary was the better team throughout the contest. And it's more disappointing that we surrendered a point to them. But, you know, it, the important thing for us is getting the second point, And we did. And we now passed Las Vegas and are now third in Pacific again. I think just because of what happened last week, um, or sorry, last season, this well, last week too, because of what happened last week, I think the Flames had enough momentum coming into this game that they could finally believe they could do it. And after what happened last season with Colorado and earlier this season with Colorado, I really think this game had to be a measuring stick for the Flames. And one thing I was seeing tonight that I really liked was every line seemed to be playing system hockey. Like in the past, we've seen some games where... It looked like maybe the first and the fourth line weren't doing their jobs or the first line wasn't doing their job. Everyone tonight seemed to know what their role was and every line was playing within the system. And that's how you're going to win. Yeah, and I thought Gaudreau's line actually did not look like a defensive liability in this one, uh, which is a nice turn of events because they usually have been this season. And... I thought that on the overall, I thought all four lines played rather effectively. And y you know a team like Colorado is going to be giving you a hard time. They have a lot of good talent there. And, you know, we were kind of unlucky last year to face them in the first round because they were a lot better of a team than they their stand 
place in the standings designated. But, you know, it you have to be good to win, and last year in the playoffs the Flames weren't, and tonight they were. And it, Even Jankowski got a point tonight. I know. That's how good they were. Yeah. He yeah, got the I, second I, assist I, on the Froelich goal. Yeah, I think that uh, he somebody must have been beacon at him to give him a hard time after Ronaldo scored. So Long played right into Colorado. Yeah. And, and you knew that he was like, I have to get something here. Come on. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, well, now he's got something. He's I think he's the guy who's played the most this season without a single point. So at least he's got something now. Yeah. Um, and, you know... Like I know I've been criticizing Jankowski at times this season, but he over the last like eight or nine games he's looked more like himself, and I think that he's due for a breakout any time now, as well. And he's the entire season he's actually been an extremely good penalty killer, and that's the only reason why I think he's been remaining in the lineup most nights. But uh, now he's looking more like himself the opportunistic guy who can chip in every once in a while and if he can continue to get some assists going and continue the depth scoring that this team's been missing that then that'll bode well for both him and the flames two things i think that when we look at the stats uh help the flames win tonight big face off win percent 61 percent wins and you know we've talked about it and coaches have told us when you win the face-off, especially in the offensive zone, you control that play, and you're not trying to get it back right away. So that's big for the Flames. Also, only four penalty minutes to the Avalanche is six. And we know that last year this team had a hard time staying out of the box sometimes. So I think those are two keys to winning for the Flames tonight. Yeah, and as long as this team can start getting some goals and like and depth scoring as well as scoring from the top two lines this team will be fine it's that's the main reason why they've been having such difficulty this whole season is that they just can't seem to get things going properly throughout their lineup but since the bill peters firing it seems that all of the lines are firing and it's made everything a lot easier with that win, the Calgary Flames now have 36 points. They've played 32 games this season, 16 wins, 12 losses, and four overtime losses, um, which puts them third in the Pacific, as you mentioned earlier, Matt. The only teams higher than us in the Pacific are Edmonton and Arizona, both tied at 40 points. We play again tomorrow night, so we could by Wednesday, by the time everyone hears this show, theoretically, we could be two points away from tying the first in the Pacific. Yeah, and considering how this entire season has based up until the last five games has been everything going wrong for this team, the fact that even though everything has gone wrong, they're still third in the Pacific and only four points out of first against two teams that, frankly, I don't think will be even in the playoffs at the end of the season. Well, and even if they don't get the win tomorrow night in the back-to-back, -back, after that, we've got a four-game homestand. So, you know, I think it's pretty, with the way this team's been playing, and especially playing at home, I think you're going to see them, you know, probably get up there, uh, let's say by the 20th, which is when the homestand is over. Yeah, and I could definitely, by the, all, or the Christmas break, I think the Flames will be back in first if they continue to play as they have. Yeah, it just, it just shows that this team can do it. And, you know, they had a rough month, but, and Derek Ryan said it earlier this season when I was in a, a scrum in the dressing room with him. And he said, we didn't go through any adversity last year. This is the first real adversity this team's gone through. And he said, the question will be, how do we work through that adversity? And you know what? They were able to do it. They made their way through, they worked through the adversity and now they're coming out the other side. So hopefully knowing that they were able to do that in November, that's going to make them stronger when it comes to the playoffs. The thing is that this team had too much talent to be as bad as they were all year. Well, I said we knew it had to turn around at some point. It was just a matter of when. Yeah. And like you look at Johnny Gaudreau's shooting percentage of 6.7%. That's not going to last. 
you know, he's too good of a player to be having that kind of a shooting percentage. So, you know, things will continue to turn around and improve for this team. And especially, thankfully, with the next month and a half's worth of schedule, there are not too many games after this next little stretch that are against good teams. So Calgary, like, if they continue playing like this, they will separate themselves from everybody else. Well, and, you know, I mean, I was kind of poking fun at Goudreau earlier tonight, saying that, you know, Lucic is, you know, only four goals behind him and stuff like that. But I just have this feeling, based on who Johnny Goudreau is and what his scoring pace is, as soon as he gets this monkey off his back and gets going again, I think he's going to, like, bust open the floodgates. I think we're bound to see some two- and three-goal games from this guy fairly soon. Yeah, I think so as well, and I wouldn't be shocked if he, like, explodes for a hat-trick at some point in the near future. Um, frankly, like, uh, looking at the schedule, like, uh, the game against Arizona and Edmonton are really the only games this month that are against higher quality playoff teams as of right now. Well, those are the only two teams that right now are above us in the Pacific. Yeah, and that's it. Like, uh, Carolina and Pittsburgh are both uh, wildcard teams, as are the Dallas Stars, and everybody else is significantly below that. And you know the way I look at those games, Toronto, Carolina, Pittsburgh, Montreal, they are free points in a way, but it's also, if you need to give away a point, those are the ones to do it in. You know, we don't want to give a point to Arizona or Edmonton, but if you absolutely have to give away a point, give it to Toronto, Carolina, Pittsburgh, or Montreal, because it doesn't matter. Yeah. And, like, even, like, right through to January 18th, there's only the two games against Edmonton and one against Arizona that are against higher quality teams. Like, it, it's a really protracted, long stretch for this team where they're going up against either adequate teams like Pittsburgh, Dallas, Carolina, or just awful teams like Minnesota, Chicago, Montreal, Ottawa, that kind of thing. Well, this is why I said to you, you know, a couple weeks ago that this is the month Calgary has to get their footing. Yeah, and they have to this point, and hopefully that the, they can carry this momentum into tomorrow's game and get another win in that one and keep the ball rolling. How much of this, Matt, do you think is that honeymoon period that we see from a team with a new coach versus, you know, this co- this team is just clicking and probably, let's say, would have with Peters? Um, well, you I know, think... Like there's, there's always that 10, 20 games when a team just comes out and plays crazy good for a new coach. Yeah, it, I find that usually the... Uh, a new coach usually struggles for a bit once they uh, take over. Um, cause well, that's because they're often trying to change the system. And I think the benefit here is that Ward is really, you know, from the same system and keeping a lot of the same systems. Yeah. And I think that the difference there is that just the black cloud of Bill Peters has gone. And I think that everybody's just in a lot better mood. And. Like, I know myself that, like, if I'm going to work and I'm not in a very good mood, that I'm not going to be doing as good of a job as if I'm actually in a happy mood. And I think that goes for just about anybody. And I think that the hockey players are the same way. And I think this team's just been basically upset for a while. And especially because they're frustrated because things aren't going right. And then, you know everything going sideways and now everything seems to be a lot lighter around the team and everybody seems to be having fun again and i think that small change is making all the difference yeah i'm i and that's kind of what i was getting at is do you think it's a difference we're going to see all season or is it sort of a honeymoon period and i'll drop off and i think this team's rebounded. I mean, yeah, there's still going to be some, you know, probably two, three game losing streaks. There is for every team, but I think this team's rebounded for the season. Yeah. Well, I think that, and not to blame Bill Peters entirely, but I think that just the negativity around the team was holding them back for the first two months of the season. And like the Flames just had simply too much talent to be as bad 
as they have been. And now that I think will swing back the other way where this team should be better than average the rest of the way. I totally agree. Um, one of the big stories this week for the Flames was some new forward lines. And we really saw these lines for at least parts of all three games this week. Um, we saw Jeff Ward come in and really utilize his forwards in different ways. The first line, if you will, was Kachuk, Lindholm, and Mangiapane. The second line of Dubé, Monaghan, and Backlund. Backlund playing wing on that line. Uh, Milan Lucic, Derek Ryan, and Johnny Goudreau. And then Tobias Reeder, Mark Jankowski, and Michael Froelich. Let's call that our fourth line. That's at least what the Flames started with tonight in Colorado. Um a lot of fans negative about putting Johnny on the quote unquote third line, but you know what? It's worked for them so far. And I think that this is really, I mean, when you and I have talked about breaking guys up and putting them on different lines, we probably never would have put Johnny with Lucic and Ryan, but you know what? It's worked for the team and it's really moved that scoring around and we've seen great success this week with it. Yeah. And sometimes you just need to shake things up a bit just to, shake it up and try it because you never know when you're going to find new chemistry and I think that uh, at times double shifting Goudreau on that line I think they've gone back to Monaghan with Backlund and uh, Goudreau but they seem to kind of do that when they're ahead yeah but it's always good to like I always view it as that if you're one setup is really struggling if you have experience playing with the other guys then you're not like completely trying to figure out okay where am i supposed to be how am i supposed to pass the puck to this guy and all that or knowing when you're going to get a pass and all that kind of stuff and if you have that experience and you know what to expect if the first line is not working as such you can switch it around and hope that things start clicking in the new way of doing it and calgary one of the things that i've been a little bit concerned about is that like over the last year and a half two years is that they only play the game one way and and like it it's fine to have the system be the system and all that but there's there hasn't been a lot of like in case of X, you know, do Y type of thing. And, like, if the Flames have the lead and they desperately need the two points, like, I don't find that they're experienced enough or talent, like, coached in a way to be able to effectively shut the other team down and, like, switch their game plan accordingly and go into shutdown mode and... Teams that I find that tend to be successful, especially in the playoffs, have that other gear when they have the lead that they can just shut that whole thing down and play the opportunistic game instead. And I I find that this is a step in the right direction by having lines being able to switch on the fly. And, you know, I think they need to take that next step of figuring out how to like shut the other teams down now yeah i think even more than that i think you're activating different parts of a guy's game you know i mean we've always seen johnny goudreau for example sort of the speed guy and when you're playing with ryan and lucic you can't just speed to the net and i think they're trying to you know get him to slow down and be more of a make some more plays on that line and i think with you know on andrew mangiapane on the first line they're really trying to get him out there passing that puck to the other two guys. Like, I think it's just a way to get guys playing different roles than maybe they wouldn't. So when you need to play that in the future, you've, you're more comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause you need to have that muscle memory of, okay, I can play it in this manner or that manner. And just depending on the situation and, And I think too many times in the past, this team has relied on guys for one thing. I mean, even in the playoffs, it's, you know what, put Goudreau in front of the net, he'll score, but someone's got to get it to him. So if we can say, okay, let's put Goudreau on a line where maybe he has to do a little bit more work to get that puck in scoring position, then when the playoffs come or a game comes where maybe, you know what, he's covered and and, uh, Monaghan or Lindholm is open, he'll have more, more comfort being that playmaker. Yeah. 
I agree. So, so I think it's it's a good change. We'll see how long it lasts for. I think you know the team's winning with these lines, and as you mentioned, they've gone back to some of their old lineup um, and you know line pairings and trios and whatnot. But I wouldn't be surprised if we see some more shuffling in the next week here, as I as I think. Um, the new coaching staff figures out who they think will go best where. And you know what? I think in the end, we'll go back to the regular lines, if you will. But I think that they're going to do some more mixing and matching here until Christmas. And it doesn't hurt. Like, especially if you're winning, that's when it's not a bad thing to tweak minor things along the way. And, you know, because if you're on a roll, you'll still end up likely winning those games, even if you're screwing around a lot with the lines. And, you know, this team needs to just have the increase their range, so to speak. And I think that this is a small step in that right direction. And hopefully that continues so that way they can treat every opponent differently. And, and I think that's a big part of it, too. I think last year, even in the playoffs, we all said, you know what, Colorado figure us out. And I think you need more lines you can move to, even if it's like an A configuration, a B configuration, just to throw teams off and play them differently, depending on how you need to play that team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because usually in the playoffs, you play three or f even four different types of teams, depending on like it's not like you're playing the same style of team. As you're going well, but even through. when you're playing one series against the same team, you want to shake it up a bit between you know each game because if they figure out your game, it's a lot easier to shut you down. I think that's a lot of what happened last year. Yeah, is Calgary got their game shut down? Yeah, and they couldn't adapt and then panic because oh, what we're doing isn't working. Ah, what do we do? And yeah, they panicked and lost. Yep. So you know we'll we'll see what happens this year, but I really think that. Um, I, I think this is a good thing. I know a lot of fans are thinking that, you know, Goudreau got banished to the third line or it's punishment. You know what? I think it's just getting him out there some guys he wouldn't usually play with. Yeah, exactly. And if you're winning, this is the time to do it. And, you know, change things up, getting people into different situations, it always helps. And, you know, more knowledge about yourself as a player and all of that and knowledge of more situations does nothing but help those players in case they happen to find themselves in weird situations. And it's just like Ovechkin. Like, he's, for the entirety of his, the early part of his career, it was, I go out, I score. And that's it. And the Capitals continually lost in the first or second round because of the fact that they needed him and everybody else to be doing multiple things and he retooled his game and was able to play more of a defensive role in addition to you know going out and sniping those pucks and the capitals ended up winning the stanley cup and are looking like the favorite right now in the east alongside boston and you know it's one of those things that this team will also have to learn is how to play at both ends of the rink. Yeah, and uh, you know, you mentioned it earlier that I think it was um, the Lucic line you thought looked more defensively responsible, and that's part of learning too. Is I think you know one of the knocks on Johnny has been he's maybe not as defensively responsible as he needs to be. But you know what? He's getting it together, and he's um, you know playing. I think a better game this week, and I think that's part of what the coaches want here is they just want these guys to play a different game and learn different elements. And seeing saying that you saw that come together, um, you know, in this game, I think you said it was this game that you saw come yeah. together. That's that's what they want, right? Yeah, especially like a game team against Colorado, like. If the Flames make it out of our division in say they win the first two rounds and are going into the conference finals, you're likely going to be playing either Colorado or St. Louis. And each one of those teams is very good for different reasons. St. Louis is a very defensively oriented team with a lot of offense. And the Avalanche are the high-flying, you know, the buzz you type team. And Calgary needs to learn how to be able to Eat, beat both of those styles of team 
if they want to go to the Stanley Cup Finals, and that's not an easy thing to do. And like last year, they got embarrassed because they didn't know how to beat the the buzzer team that the Avalanche are. And the Avalanche are beatable if you know how to play them. And Calgary just didn't have the right mix last year. And, you know, they just panicked and lost. And it's, you know, Calgary did a very good job today with dealing with them. And, you know, they'll have a lot more difficulty in the playoffs playing them because they'll be likely full strength instead of missing their starting goaltender and Kale McCarr. But, you know, they need to just... Well, not their star and McCarr, but also their top two goaltenders. Yeah, and, you know, if they can figure out how to beat these teams, then that'll bode well for April, May, June, instead of, you know... The, like, oh, we're a great regular season team, and then, yeah, go golfing two weeks after Edmonton does. <laughs> yeah, and I think even just, you know, trying to get a few elements of, of these things in the guys' games. You know, if you can get a little more defensive responsibility in Johnny's game, or a little more offensive uh, side in Lucic's game. Not that we need everyone to do everything, because that's never going to happen, but, you know, just kind of polishing those rough edges. Yeah, exactly. And nobody's perfect, you know, you know, Every player needs to learn. Like, look at Steve Eiserman, for example. Like, he's renowned now as being like one of the best captains in NHL history and all that. But there was a lot, long, long time where he was thought of as a defensively inept, you know, all offense loser, basically. Like, the, they uh, even had a trade that fell through at the last minute that would have sent him to Ottawa for Alexei Yashin back in, like, 95. And, you know, it, it wasn't until he changed his game and learned to rough, you know, smooth those rough edges that he and the Red Wings took it the next steps to actually win. Well, even winning. here, I mean, if you look at the guy whose number we retired last year, Jerome was a great offensive player, terrible in his own end. Yeah, and he never changed, and he never won the cup. Well, Matt, a big question for me looking at this lineup, and we're talking about this lineup and some of the changes. Austin Zarnick, healthy now, uh, came off of the IR on December 5th and was sent down to Stockton for a conditioning stint. But looking at the lineup and where he is, I don't know what you end up doing with Zarnik when that condition stints over. I mean, we've seen Ronaldo called up. He'll go back down. We've seen Dubé called up. I think Dubé's earned a spot on this team, and I think it's going to be hard to to not keep him here. And just budget-wise and everything, I really think at this point you might be better to waive Ronaldo and just – or, sorry, waive uh, Zarnik and send him down full-time. Yeah. It, well, this is what the Flames really needed was the young players to – seize their opportunities and i mean man japan he started tonight on line one dube on line two i know and that's huge for this team like those guys needed to take those spots and run with it and especially dube like manjapane has been good on the second line for you know when he's played there but Dubé has just come in and been a tour de force on the third line for us. and He didn't look great last year. He looks like he's ready for the NHL this year. Yeah, and I think that moving forward, he is going to be the second line right winger, which that's awesome. But uh, I think that for now, you have to keep him in the lineup as either the second or third line winger and you know shift Manjapane around as needed but he's just bringing so much energy to this lineup that you can't just ditch him right now because he's too good and that's what you need (laughs) frankly yeah you you definitely need it you need a guy who's forced his way in the lineup a guy who's cheap i mean if we look at you know the costs here dubay's making less than eight hundred thousand. the flames are strapped for cash that's definitely what you you know what you need from these guys 
Um, is someone cheap to come in and play that way? And Dubé's making a, a play for the lineup. You can't deny that he looks like an NHL player. And how can we not give the guy the you know the spot when that's the case? You can't really say, well, you're playing so well, but back down you go. Like I think there's really only two options here. I think you've got to either wave Zarnik, and I think Zarnik will clear. Yeah. So or I... you wave Janko, and I'm not so sure he clears. Yeah, and I agree with you there too because if you know if i'm looking at picking parts off of the flames team at uh, jankowski would be like one of my number one targets just because he looks like he was just struggling to struggle at the beginning of the season but he's looking more like himself with each passing game and i think that like he's due for a breakout himself and i don't see like honestly i'd send reader down before Jankowski and yeah that could happen too I didn't think about that that could be the other option yeah and I think Reader would clear similarly and it, well it, Reader Reader's already cleared I don't think it's been 10 games since he cleared yeah yeah I guess we but have if, to figure if, that out yeah if, if he has to clear again I don't see him getting claimed now anyway but yeah I, like I think that Zarnik, uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't know as if he adds a spot in the lineup right now. And frankly, I think that the Flames are going to have a few too many bodies soon. And there's not really much that you, they can do. Like, especially when Sam Bennett comes back. Like, frankly, to me, Reader and Ronaldo have to go away. And Zarnik can pretty much join them. Like, it, it's... Yeah, Frolik has done very well lately as well. He scored tonight, and he's looking like a very good fourth liner. And he, you know, you can if you keep him in the lineup, like there's just and have Bennett, like there's not really any room anywhere in the lineup for anybody at the moment. Yeah, it's you know I'm looking at the lineup here, and it's tough to say. Who you want to send down? Obviously, Ronaldo gets sent down. I think, like you said, Reader's probably the next best option. Um, but yeah, Dubé, you've got to find a way to keep him here. Yeah. And I don't know. It's going to be tough money wise. Like you mentioned, for a leak, you're not you're not waving for a leak and sending him down. No, and like uh, that's a bad message to send to any free agents that you might want to sign too. That. Oh, well, you know, it, it's the last year of your deal. You're looking for a new contract. And, oh, we're going to send you to the minors, effectively ending your NHL career. Well, I think like, it's a poor use of the asset, too. I think if you just wait a little bit, you can get something for the asset. I know. And I think that for only, like, especially at the trade deadline, would be included in whatever deal that the Flames make at the deadline. I mean, we kind of joked earlier, say goodbye to that third line pick for Neil. I think you could probably recover a third or a fourth for Frolik alone if you need to. Yeah, or include him for salary purposes otherwise. Like, but, if you know, we don't have, I mean... Yeah, like if hypothetically, could, say the Flames go after Taylor Hall and actually get him. And, you know, you if New Jersey, like, eats, like, a, a third of the remainder of Hall's contract which is not much and the Flames send for a leak that that's basically the whole entirety of the contract and so for a Hall without adding any money and then it's just a matter of like whatever other assets for Hall and I'm not saying to get Hall specifically but you know like that's where that situation would work and Calgary could easily get away with doing that just by including for a leak. Just looking at the lineups here, I mean, Kachuk, Lindholm, Manjapani, none of them are going anywhere. Uh, as far as going down to the A to make room for Dubé, you're not sending Backlund and Monaghan anywhere. You're not going to send Lucic, Ryan, or Goudreau. So really, you're down to, if we don't send for leak, you're down to Ronaldo, Jankowski, and Zarnik. Yeah. Like, you know, at this point, I think you, you you don't even really have room for the 13th forward then. I think at this point you send Ronaldo down. Well, maybe keep Ronaldo just because he's cheap. But, um, you know, I think, you, yeah, you send Zarnik down and keep Dubé here. Yeah, either that or uh, Ronaldo and Reader 
It just depends on. Well, we we need a, we need to carry a thirteenth. Yeah, no. Well, Zarnik would be the thirteenth in that case. Well, but... I don't think we have the money to carry Zarnik. I think he's over a million. You got to send him down to keep Dubé. Yeah. So it'll yeah, be we'll see... some interesting accounting. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I can also see here if the Flames need to, and we see this generally once or twice a year, and usually it's not the Flames that do it. I think the last time we did was Hagman, where a guy clears waivers and then gets traded for a low-round pick. I could also see something like that happen with either Zarnik or Reader. I think they like Reader and want to hang on to him, but um, I could see like Zarnik clears and we get a fifth form or something. Yeah. Well, I think Reader is more valuable for us as, like, in case the Flames are going up against a team like Colorado in the playoffs. Well, Reader's also a lot cheaper. He's making league minimum. So if we're yeah. against the cap, you want to hang on to him. Yeah. But, you know, he helps to control the speed game because he's one of the few fast players that are in the organization, like true Blazers. And I think that that is a more important asset, in the, especially in the playoffs, than you know certain other aspects of games it's just like how matthew nieto sucked last year for colorado all season only had like three goals all year and i think scored three goals against us in the first round alone so you know it, yeah I, I just think that it's going to come down to money not so much the player you want but i think reader's going to stay because he's cheap yep and that's perfectly fine you know like between him and zarnik it's pretty much a coin toss in my opinion anyway um, one other note we should make for this week, um, talking about some changes to the team, is the Flames have a new assistant coach. As we know, um, Jeff Ward got moved up to interim head coach, which left a vacancy on the bench. Craig Conroy was filling that vacancy, and the Flames have now made some sh- some shuffles. Their former director of player personnel, Ray Edwards, has joined the coaching staff effective immediately, and I guess he's now taken over where Ward was in charge of the power play and the special teams. For those that don't know Ray Edwards, he's a former head coach in the AHL for six seasons with Portland and San Antonio, um, and he joined the Calgary Flames in the 2015-2016 season in their player development department. So the coaching staff as it sits now is Jeff Ward is the interim head coach. Uh, the assistants are Ryan Huska, Marty Jelena, Ray Edwards, and Jamie Pringle, the video coach, along with Jordan Siglett our goaltending coach. So just a note there um, that the flames have finally filled that role and we're not going to see Craig Connor hang out on the bench anymore. Yep. Well, Matt, I think overall, if we sum up this week in one sentence or even one word, what would your word be for this week? Well, I'm not going to say what you're going to say. I'm not going to do it again. I got flack on Twitter. I, I can't, I can't make my pun with the, uh, with the coach's name this week. Yeah. Well, they did have another excellent week. <laughs> they they won some games under Jeff Ward this week. Yes. That's as close as I'll go. Yeah, no, I mean, it was... And even outside the wins, these were good games. And I was saying to people coming into this week, in some ways, I don't care if they win. They just need a show they can put together more than 40 minutes of good hockey. And, I mean, the wins definitely we needed, but it's not just the wins. We're seeing this team finally playing complete games yeah like if you play like crap for like the halloween game against uh nashville where they were down four nothing after two periods and were looking like a tire fire and yet ended up winning that game like yeah that's awesome but um that's not how you have any sustainable success in this league and like it's important how they play and ever since ward took over frankly this team has been playing how they were early in last season when they were just walking all over everybody and i think that it's huge for them to be playing that way and if they can continue to play like that then similar to last season they're just going to walk all over everybody well i think that about covers this week for the calgary flames anything that we've missed matt uh well, uh, yeah. Matt, I guess the only other thing we have is Dustin Wolf, the goaltending prospect the Flames drafted last year. You and I got a good look at him at rookie camp. He's been invited to the uh, U.S. World Junior team. So good to see uh, a Flames prospect on that level again. It's been a while since we've 
it's really been a while since we've seen, I think, a top Flames prospect at the World Juniors. Yeah, and, and that's why I've always been a fan of uh, the Flames adding a goalie at some point in the draft. And I think the Flames got really lucky that uh, Wolf is uh, slightly shorter than what you know teams are looking for now. Uh, because just on raw talent, he's an excellent goaltender. He has five shutouts in 15 games this season and is looking like a top-tier goalie prospect, very much in the similar mold as Carter Hart. And if Wolf progresses down that same path, then the Flames are not going to be having too many difficulties in that. We're going to get... Um... We're going to get our Stockton correspondent, Jeff Gregory, on again soon and find out what's happening in the AHL. Um, we've finally gone back to two goalies in the A and two goalies in the E. But, yeah, I think Wolf's doing well. We'll see. It looks like Zagadulin's still doing well. I think we've yeah, got 10 some... Yeah, 10-1-1 one one there for Zagadulin in 12 starts. So. Yeah, like we got some good goaltending talent in this in this system. Well, Matt, let's look ahead to the predictions for the week. We made predictions last week. There was three games. I thought we would win all three. You thought we'd win Colorado and Buffalo and drop L.A. So I get another point here. I'm now 3 nothing this year. I have almost as many wins in a row as the Flames do. Uh, the Flames are at 5, and I'm at 3. So we'll see if I can keep my streak going like the Flames are going to try and do. Yeah. Oh, and one other thing to add with uh, prospects, uh, Matthew Phillips has 25 points in 22 games in Stockton this year, which is absolutely an amazing for him uh, and like any player, frankly, in the AHL because those stats are dynamite. Like Usually yeah. if you're over 35 points in a season, uh, you're on the verge of making the NHL. And so for him to be over a point a game, uh, like you're looking at a potential top six forward down the road. We'll get some more information on him when we talk with Jeff in the future. Yeah. Uh, so three games this week, Matt. Tomorrow night we're on the second half of a back-to-back against Arizona in Arizona. Then the Flames come home on Thursday night for a 7 p.m. start against the Toronto Maple Leafs. And on Saturday, a 2 p.m. start in the Sal Dome against the Carolina Hurricane. So those are our three... Uh, games for the week. Do you think that we see Talbot again in the second half of this back-to-back? I would actually be somewhat surprised if Talbot played tomorrow. I think that uh, with Arizona being such a good team this year that I think you have to throw Riddick in there. Even though Do you it's play a Talbot at home this week then? Uh, possibly against Carolina, but I might even just run the table with Riddick. You know, I was surprised that he got the L.A. game, but I think Ward probably wants to get them going a little bit more evenly. Yeah. I could see Talbot tomorrow, but because it's a divisional opponent and Arizona's one of the only two teams ahead of us, I think that they might just go with Riddick again, and maybe Talbot gets either Toronto or Carolina. Well, predicting uh, Flames sweeping every week has done me well for the last two weeks, so I'm going to do the same again. I think they'll beat Arizona, beat Toronto, beat Carolina, and I think they'll sweep the uh, the week with six points, and that should put them at the top of the Pacific if they do that. You know, I was going to predict a sweep last week, but I didn't want to copy you, and I was going to predict a sweep this week, and I didn't want to copy you. So I'll say that they're going to drop tomorrow's game and win the, the next two. In my heart, that's kind of how I feel. Um, but I don't know. The sweep's done me well, so I might as well keep going with it. Yep. You know, it, it's one of those one of those weird weeks where it's like, you know, what we're it could go either way with tomorrow. I think tomorrow is the big question for this team, and I think if they can make it through tomorrow. I mean, this win streak has to end at some point. We know that, right? And I think tomorrow it might be when it ends. Yeah. We'll see. Like this, you know, each of the opponents over the next five games are good enough where they they can sneak up on you and beat you. And but we're not going to have a 10-game win streak. Oh, I know. Uh, I mean, but, 10 games you know, take us to the end of the homestand. Yeah. Like, I... Calgary just needs to take each game one at a time and treat the opponent seriously. And if they take the foot off the gas at all, they'll lose. Because 
each of those five teams could beat the Flames at any given point in time. Yeah. But, you know, hmm. hopefully they win most, if not all. Frankly, between, like, over those five games, if the Flames go three and two, that would be fine. Yeah, I, I think if there's one that they, I don't want to say should lose, but if there's one that they are going to face the most adversity in, it'll be the Arizona game. I think Toronto, eh, they're getting their game back together. I think there's always energy against Toronto. As weird as that sounds, just because the Maple Leafs, it's always a full house here. Um, I could see the team taking their foot off the gas for the Carolina game, unfortunately. Yeah. It's an afternoon game that doesn't really mean a lot. I could see if there's going to be one game that I think... I mean, even if they lose to Arizona, I think it's going to be a good Flames game. But if there's one that they're going to take their foot off the gas this week, I think it'll be that Carolina game. Yeah, I agree. But we'll see. I, I'm hoping I'm hoping another sweep. That'll put us, what, five, uh, six, seven, eight game win streak. And usually a good team gets their eight game win streak at some point, seven or eight games. Yeah. And Calgary, like they're finally playing like Calgary. So yeah. hopefully that continues. And yeah, they make up for some of the early nonsense this season. And I, I all I want to do is between now and when we play Edmonton is us being ahead of Edmonton when that game starts. That's that to me is the only thing that matters right now, and yeah. you know then we can push for the playoffs and you know winning the division and all that. But as long as we're ahead of Edmonton at the game after Christmas, that to me is the only important thing. We have one fan question here that I forgot to ask you earlier. It came in later than usual. Um, we ask every every Monday on Twitter when we record, what do you guys want us to talk about? Do you have any burning questions or uh, hot opinions you want us to, to mention? And Ryan Swanson at 76 Swanson on Twitter asked us, who could you see the Flames trading for in the next couple months? So he's not necessarily looking at what would the trade be, I guess, or who would we get rid of, but who can we see the Flames going after or bringing in and of course there's a question of who's going to go out for that but i'll be honest here just looking around the league i don't see a lot of trade partners i think if the flames make a trade in the next few months let's say what before what would a few months be end of january let's say i think it's moves for draft picks like i think if the flames are going to do something they're going to just be trying to clear salary yeah like lose a body or two well, and, and really, I mean, you mentioned Taylor Hall earlier. You're not going to be able to do the Taylor Hall deal unless you, say, move a guy like Froelich for pennies on the dollar just to free up the money. Yeah. So, you know, I I, I mean, yeah, we might see them move Zarnik for a fourth or, you know, something like that. But I just, I don't see right now what player you go out and trade for. I mean, you'd almost have to even money. And we've talked about some of that in the past. And do you want to bring in a guy like, you know, an Ocposo just because he's close to even money to something we might want to give up. Yeah. Frankly, for what I see is the Flames needs uh, the rest of the way. Like, the goaltending, that's fine. Um, they could use another veteran defenseman, possibly. I think they, I think but, they want to wait until Valimaki comes back. Yeah, and that's where you would probably leave that one right till deadline day just to give Valimaki as much time. And, if and I think Valimaki yeah. will get sent to the AHL when he gets back, but, you know, they're, they're yeah, not he, doing badly with Stone in that kind of veteran depth role. Yeah, and it's one of those where if Valimaki plays like Valimaki should, then, you know, scratch that as a need entirely. Um, and outside of that, uh, before I was saying the Flames could use uh, two top nine wingers, and I think that uh, with Dubé and Manjapane uh, emerging, if you can get a legitimate top six forward, go for it. Uh, whether it's Taylor Hall or some other, you know, legitimate top six forward, then go for it. But it's not at, like that would be a like to have instead of absolutely need to have like it was earlier and if Dubé and Manjapane can continue playing that well you know it, it would be perfectly fine if say Eat Bread was on the fourth line even though he's playing that well because you'll have scoring right up and down the lineup instead of 
you know, just concentrated on the first three lines. And, you know, if, say, hypothetically, the Flames got Taylor Hall, like, that, you know, the Flames would have, like, as lethal of a top six as anybody in the league. I just, I mean, he's asking for the next couple months here, and I don't think the Taylor Hall move happens till the deadline, if that early. Yeah, and I agree. You know, but, and, but and I honestly, and, yeah. and I would be surprised if, in some ways I'd be surprised if it even happens at the deadline. I can see him just wanting to go to UFA, but um, we'll, we'll see. I, I just, I don't think Calgary's going to make that deal if they do before the deadline. So the only thing I can really see them doing before the deadline, unless they fall into another slump, but kind of based on where they are today, I think it's draft picks that we move for. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't really see the Flames, like, uh, outside of, like, dumping a body or two off of the bottom end of the roster, I don't really see any trade happening But that's it. Right if now. you're, if you, even if you dump that body, what are you going to get back, right? I mean, we, yeah. we can't take back NHL salary. Yeah, it would be probably for filler prospect or seventh round pick or something yeah. like that. So, you know, and, and even filler prospect, I mean, we've kind of got all of our filler prospects we need of some of our old guys i think at this point it either becomes draft pick or conditional draft pick yeah I that agree. to me is really the only way this team can go is moving something i don't want to say for nothing but for an immediate cap relief like we can't do anything until we get some cap relief so i think if they're going to make a deal in the next couple months it's just got to be a relief deal mm -hmm. i agree that's really all you can do yep and right. we'll see. Uh, like, uh, I don't expect any deals really until towards the deadline or a few weeks before, like middle of February. But yeah, I, I think we're going to get something before that just because I think they want to be ready for the deadline and get some stuff moved. But I don't think it's going to be anything big. Like I said, I think it might be Zarnik for a fifth or, you know, something like that just to start moving salary and get ready and make room on our, you know, even on our main roster for Dubé. I think that's the number one thing right now. Yeah, and I'm glad that Dubé is playing as well as he is, and that's instrumental for this team moving forward. Like, they need to have guys, young guys coming in and taking spots, and, like, I'm sure that Matthew Phillips, if he continues to play like that, he will play himself into the NHL this season because, like, if he's still a point per game at the end of the month or next month, then, like, you have to I give think the, the only shot. reason he's here is uh, cap reasons. Yeah. He, the could, only reason he's not here, I should say, is cap reasons. Yeah, because a player that's scoring that well, like, you remember, like, uh, when Pittsburgh recalled Jake Gensel when he was in the minors, because he was having a very similar season to what Phillips is having, and Gensel ended up being an instrumental part of the Penguins' playoff run that year in them winning a Stanley Cup. And if Phillips is playing to such an extremely good level where – He's just scoring at will, basically, in Stockton. You're going to have to give him a shot. Even if he's just playing on the fourth line, if he chips in the odd goal here and there, that's huge for this team. Yeah, I don't think they're going to do much until Bennett is back and they really get a look at their lineup with, say, Dubé in there as well. So I think if they do anything, it's, it's a simple depth move for a pick just to clear up a roster spot, clear up some salary. Yep, I agree. And it'll be interesting to see. Like, there's a lot of storylines that are interesting to watch over the next month or so. For sure. Well, Matt, that's it for this week. Um, let's reconvene next week and hope that this team's still on a win streak. That's about all we can ask for at this point. Well, as long as they play 60-minute efforts, even if they lose the next three but are playing very well in those losses... That's all you can ask for. And, uh, like, especially after the start to this season where, like, we're both going, uh, when is this team going to show up? And, you know, are they going to show up? Are they going to show up on time? Like, any of it? You know, like, them playing as they are, like, that's a massive change in the right direction, and hopefully it continues. It has to at this point. I, I mean, if it doesn't, then I think... They're still right on the verge where if it doesn't continue, they're going to fall out of contention. Yeah, I agree. Right? They they have they don't have to win them all, but they've got to at least keep playing this way. I agree. And hopefully, 
the positives keep going. <laughs> we'll find out, Matt. We'll talk to you next week. As always, go Flames, go. And at least it's not an award-winning week this time. Jeez, Dan. I didn't so say bad. it. I didn't say it. <laughs> Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.